Perfect. Um, it's, a it's a little louder. Okay, good. Uh, I might just be able to hold the headphone right up to my face. Um, I wrote a book called Blue Shadow after I wrote I Fell in Love with Hope. Um, it's supposed to be this psychological thriller about a writer who lost all her memories. And all she remembers is that she was trying to solve this serial murder case in Pennsylvania in this really small town called Eden. And when she goes back there uh, at the crime scene, she meets this ghost who doesn't let anybody else see him but her. And this ghost named Blue and the writer, whose name is Anna, they essentially try to solve this murder together. Yeah. So, yeah. No, and I had the pleasure of reading the first chapter. It was so good. I feel like you would lie to me. <laughs> and you were like, it's good. And I was like, why? I, I was reading it in a coffee shop and I genuinely enjoyed it so much. Yeah. I was so happy for it to be done though. It's so long. You know, that's not, that's not a bad thing, you know? If I'm liking a book, I want it to be longer. For me, sometimes I really like a book. It's like V. This is I call this V. Schwab syndrome because I love V. Schwab. I don't know if you've read any of her books. It, okay, she has this series called The Darker Shade of Magic, which was it was stunning, beautiful, gorgeous, amazing. I loved it, but it was three books and it ended so succinctly and well on that third book. And I was like, oh, that was a great story. I was so happy. And then. A few years later, she publishes a fourth one with like, and it was supposed to end with the third one, and that just messed everything up for me, even though I loved it. If that makes sense. I was just like, this is not the harmony that I wanted. No, that makes sense. I'm yeah. gonna jump from all the hyper-specific questions because I'm really excited to ask you these. You're asked to turn a popular song into a 150,000 word novel. Which song do you think you could turn into a novel? Oh, I'm so ready for this. I'm actually, no, it's, it's actually crazy. No, okay guys, we did not, he didn't, he sent me some of the questions, but he did not send me all of the weird hyper-specific questions. So I did not prepare for this, but I have my answers. I do not know why. No Plan by Hozier. Um, I, I don't know music, but I'll, I'll take your word for it. Okay, we'll listen to that song now, yeah. immediately. Right, right when this live ends. You have to. That's my dog, I'm sorry. No Plan by Hozier because it's just a song about of essentially being a control freak and wanting to control every part of your life that happens and you have to kind of just let go and allow life to come from you and, and at you at the same time rather than trying to paint everything in a certain light, you know? Um, yeah. And that there's joy and not knowing what happens and invulnerability and it's such a multi-layered song. Hozier's a genius, I could never do him justice, but it's something that I think I could examine really, really well. Also, some Kendrick Lamar song, I think I could definitely. <laughs> I love Kendrick Lamar, so uh, those, that's gonna be my answer. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love that question. Um, you get to choose one author, dead or alive, and author, to be on the cover of Vogue with you. Oh! Who would you want to be on the cover of Vogue with? Oh, so I would be with them? Yes. Oh, that, that narrows down my choice. <laughs> There's some bad people I would love to see on Vogue but I don't want to be next to them. I was like, Stephen King would look good on the cover of Vogue. You know, he's, he's odd looking, but in an interesting way. Kind of like Benedict Cumberbatch, if, and I don't want to be on the cover with him. <laughs> there's so many beautiful, see all, I can't say any of the women because they're so beautiful, they would outshine me. You know what, I feel like I'd have a great time sitting with Agatha Christie and just sitting in front of a camera. I feel like she's, you know, she's so confident and so sassy in everything that she writes. I feel like she would just look like so perfect, just poised on the cover of Vogue. And you would just see me looking at her like, She's just dreamy-eyed. You, you could put her on a throne, queen of mystery. She'll be on the throne, I will be on the floor, kneeling. That's the cover. Yeah. That's, there you go. Somebody draw that, please. All right, let's hop into, um, I feel like this is a more common question, but I always like hearing it. Um, what are a few books that inspire you as a writer? Uh, see, see, The Handmaid's Tale is my go-to answer, but that's not really a book that inspired write my writing. That's more so a book that just changed my life. It just it turned it on its axis. It changed the way I look at everything. I do love the writing in that book, but I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna give a less common answer. I think the books that influenced me the most as a writer, I think they're the classics I read when I was a kid. They're the classics asterisks that I was forced to read as a kid. I did not want to read them because they gave me such a good foundation for, for structure and for literacy that I think a lot of more modern books sometimes lack. I think people look over the fact that when you're younger and when you first start intaking media, whether it's books, movies, TV shows, everything, you, you tend to be really stubborn and cement things. The first types of books that you're ever uh, exposed to, first types of movies, whatever, those tend to be what stay with you for the rest of your life. And because when I was so young, when I first started reading for real, like when I was, I don't know, between, I wanna say like, 
10 and 18, you know, those are when you are probably the most influential and, and those are when my dad and my mom forced me to read a lot of classics. But I'm glad they did now just because of that foundation that they gave me. Mm -hmm. For sure. I actually feel like I didn't really touch the classics myself until later. It's not common like in the US at least for people to really um, push classics onto children just because they are difficult, they're dense, you're not going to get most of it. I still don't get most of them but it, it tends to be the overall message or sometimes even just like a line or two that really stay with you. Just Do you go back and read those books often? Sometimes, uh, most of the time I'll go back and I'll read a page when I have writer's block. I'll read a page of Charles Dickens because it's so boring <laughs> and so dense, but at the same time, it's just, it, there's something about it that that just inspires me to just get on the keyboard. And I'm like, you know what? I want to do something like that. Back to the weird, goofy questions. Okay, great. I like this one a lot. You're uh, deserted on an island in the middle of nowhere. Uh, choose two of your characters from your books that you would be stuck with. Just two. <laughs> no, it's not the just two thing, it's any of them. I, I don't know, I, I view all my characters as like my kids even when they're older than me. And it's like, ugh, I do not want to be with children on a desert island. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Um... None of the characters in I Fell In Love With Hope, they all have diseases, they'll die quickly, they're not gonna help me. No one in Blue Shadow either, really. <laughs> um, gotta pull from future projects. Oh, I gotta pull from future projects. Okay, there's a character named Rain in Death's Children, and she is part of a race called Argents, which comes from the Latin word Argent, which means silver. In real life, we call that, that's why it's called Argentina, it's because they have mountains and they look like silver. Uh, her name is Rain, she's an Argent, and that specific race of people in that book, they're known for being extremely strong and durable in any conditions and stuff like that. So I would definitely have Rain with me because she's super reliable and really strong and protective. She's my favorite character that I've probably ever written. Uh, so I have to pick another one. <laughs> you know what, just for the fun of it, um, there's a really funny character, also in Death's Children. He, he's actually the main character. He's kind of an ass, but I feel like he'd be entertaining, you know? He, like, in the midst of us trying to survive, he'd crack a joke every now and then about the fact that we're gonna die. Love that, but this is a good one. If you were to embody an author who has died, who would it be? So Lee asked me the same question. She said I would be Cormac McCarthy because she said that he, he's just an emo old man and he died very recently and she feels like he comes out in me sometimes when I see things, which was like the biggest compliment I've ever gotten in my life. Even though he had some pretty weird political views, but let me cast that aside. Like I do, I do think that his work has, has been the most touching for me, personally. Um, if you've ever read Blood Meridian, I didn't like it too much, but The Road, oh my god. Like, it's it's with me to this day. I think it's right here, actually. Yeah, it's right here. I have you. The Road. Right next to me. I want to be him, just for the talent. Yeah. Yeah. It, it can, you know, rip people's hearts out with really sad ways. I guess I do it differently. I don't do it as well as him. Will I ever? We have yet to find I haven't won a Pulitzer for ripping people's hearts out yet. He has. Back up to my questions. What are your strengths when it comes to novel writing? Like, do you have one or two ideas when it comes to writing where you're like, I feel really confident in my ability to do this and this? I've been praised for my dialogue. It just falls out. It's not something I really have to work at. It's very difficult to analyze your own strengths and weaknesses when it comes yeah, to writing. Yeah, but... I feel like other people want Yeah, that. yeah. I think, I, think, I, th I think the reason I think I'm good at dialogue is because I've been told you're good at dialogue. <laughs> Prose is something I... I'm just, I'm lyrical, I guess. Sometimes I overcorrect and I'm scared of being too lyrical, so I become a very like literal writing machine, but then it, it sounds bad, not because literal writing is bad, it's just because that's not how I naturally, you know, take the wheel. So the prose also is something I, I tend to to be able to pump out naturally. So. No, for sure. I mean, that's what I, like from reading um, Love with Hope alone, it was, was yeah. the sh but like, it just was a lot of it was so poetic and that's why I loved it so much. Yeah, oh, I'm so glad. Yeah, so that's actually tended to be people's biggest complaint is that the prose wasn't for them. But I try to remind people that English isn't my first language, not saying that I wrote it badly. I'm saying that because English isn't the only language going on in my brain, there's other languages that are influencing the way I write. Latin and French sentence structures that sometimes just work their way in there. And that's why it can be a little unfamiliar to people when they're like, oh, well, I don't like this. I ask people, like, stand outside yourself for a moment and think, do I not like this or is this just new to me? I, I do implore people to, to when they read a book that's like the writing style is so different instead of going, no, I don't like this. Just ask yourself, is the author just asking you to put in a little more work to discover something you've never seen before? So.
So. Yeah. Oh, I really like that. That's Thanks. a good way to put it. Thank you. All right. Uh, like, back to writing, that you just like your weakness in terms of. That I what? Like your weakness. You think oh, weaknesses. That you're really trying to sharpen this year in terms of like anything when it comes to writing? How much time do you have? No, <laughs> I have a long list. So. What's the first one that comes to mind? Not, and this is something I work on actively, just, just not being overly analytical because I tend to write a chapter, go back and reread it, and I think that that is the worst thing that anyone can do when writing. I think you just need to write and not touch it. You need to, you need to finish it before you start going back and changing things. Because yeah. if you do that, you're going to end up spending 70% of your energy on the first 30% of the book and then you're going to get burnt out because you're trying to make everything perfect. Things you are probably going to have to rewrite, wasting, and I, and I do that. I, I have done that a lot and so I'm working really hard with myself on writing and then when I stop writing, just going and doing something else, going to read code because if I get stuck in this analytical cycle, no work gets done. So, mostly, mostly that. Yeah, just gave me advice that I needed to hear. Yeah, no, I, I think a lot of people, a lot of people are like that. It's perfectionism, but perfectionism is a disease. If, if you spend so much time focusing on, on every single step being perfect, you're never gonna walk forward. I remember that next writing session. So yes, just... please trip, that's how you find things. Allow yourself to just... You're locked in a cabin for a month of... <laughs> yeah, so, similar question. But uh, with three other writers, which other writers would you want to be locked in a cabin with for a month? Can they be authors I know? It can be, yeah. Yeah. I don't want Lee to think I love her. I have a very much bully system with Lee where we agree yeah. to hate each other publicly. But I'm going to say Lee because don't ever... Oh. She's not here. No one ever tells her this. I do love Lee very much. I view Lee like a little sister and like... Like, I, like, we're each other's mentors in a way, we teach each other so much, so we definitely have Lee Lee there. Ugh, Cormac's dead. I feel like he'd be fun in a cabin. He'd talk about depressing stuff. Donna Tart, she's so mysterious. I feel like if we were stuck in the cabin, she'd have to talk to us eventually. But Donna Tart, Lee, also Lee would be very happy to have Donna Tart there. She wouldn't talk to me, which would be lovely. She'd just talk to Donna Tart the whole time. Um, <laughs> uh, last one. Oh, Lee Bardugo. She's such a, she looks like such a fun person. She just seems like she'd be like all campfire stories and and she seems like a good cook. I can't cook. We need someone who can cook. Oh my god, girls cabin trip for the authors. Oh, this one's so mean of me. This is so mean. I'm excited. Um, all of your characters come to life and you have to kill one of them. Who do you kill? This isn't mean, I do this all the time. In real life? Yes. We don't have basements in Florida, so I can't even make a basement joke. Yeah, no, I mean, I kill off characters all the time. You've yet to see which ones in future works, but who's really annoying? Most hated character, most annoying character. <laughs> uh, I'll, kill, I'll kill Blue from Blue Shadow. He's already dead. That's, uh... Oh, so I feel like most people have a favorite type of character to read, like whether it's heroes, sunshine character, etc. Do you have a favorite type of character to write? Yes, I really love writing sassy characters who who like to push people's buttons because they incite so much conflict that's not even related to the plot. They're annoying to everybody in the book when you read them, you're like, you get to have a little laugh with yourself as shit goes down, as stuff goes down in the book, you know? Makes sense. And those are like realistic characters too. You're like, yeah, no, yeah, I can see someone like this in real life. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I compare it with a few people in real life. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. That's the thought. All right. Uh, if you were one of your characters in your current work in progress, would you? If if I were what? If you were one of your characters in like Blue Shadow, your current work in progress. It depends who. Sorry, my hair got caught my necklace. I'd say that if I were in the world in one of the books I'm currently writing, no, I would never survive. If I were one of the characters, maybe. It depends which one. But like in Death's Children, no way. No, it's it's like a Game of Thrones, Percy Jackson type of environment, and and I do not have the athleticism to survive in such a world. You do a lot of running. I can run. I can run away, but <laughs> that's all I can do. I, lo I do love running. It's definitely one of my best hobbies you can have as a writer because there's absolutely nothing to do but think and be in pain. Do you brainstorm a lot when you run? Yes, but not consensually. It just happens and don't plan for it. I come up with video ideas when I run, actually. I wish I came up with video ideas when I ran. What's your 10K time? I'm gonna be competitive. I, I, I haven't run a 10K, actually. Oh, wow. Because <laughs> I've I, uh, done four, I, I typically do three miles. And um, since 
Sometimes that's about like, that's about 5k. Yeah. So. What's your 5k time? Uh, it's probably because I I pace like eight minutes. So. Oh wow, that's better than me. So. <laughs> well, I can't do this set, so you got me there. I guess I can't. I could never do an eight minute. I could never do eight minute. Uh. Eight minute mile, what is that for kilometers? Why are you, why are you American? My 10K, my best 10K time is 57 minutes, which isn't like amazing, but that's seven, that's seven miles in about an hour. When I was done, I just like fell. I was like, oh, I can breathe. Have you ever tried to go a run club or anything? I wasn't lying when I said I'm old, by the way, like in when it comes to technology. I can't figure out a remote sometimes. What's a book trope from uh, one of your stories that you'd want to live out in real life? Like a, like a plot? Is there like a, a book trope, like, you know, any like plot line, common, uh, like scenario in your book that you're like, I want to live that out, like a family situation, like a, anything of the sorts? I'm trying to think, I don't really know many tropes. I know the, the enemies to lovers trope, um, yeah. which I kind of already lived that with my boyfriend. I definitely am that, you know, now that I think about that, I definitely am that character we talked about <laughs> the sassy one that pushes buttons. But he's yeah. worse. Oh, I'm... So bad, Brad. I'm so bad at this. Oh my god. You know, you know, like the those isekai animes. Is that a trope, technically? Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna go with that. I would love to get hit by a truck and then wake up in like Lord of the Rings. That would be sick. That would be sick. I feel like, well, for myself, I at least from your book, I the found family trope of just like, not all the death and you know the, not all the well, death. You know. That you can't have the found family without the death. Someone in the chat said age gap. Oh, you want to live the age gap trope? I mean, live your life, bro. I, as long as- wait, wait. Hold on. Depends wh what context you're talking about. I immediately thought, like, 500-year-old vampire and, like, 19-year-old person. And I was like, because I feel like on book talk, that's what they, the, the age gap they talk about. I'm like, uh, not a I guess that would be pedophilia. 500? 500 years old with 19 years old? That has to be something real. No, for real. I'm, oh my god, why is my hair caught in here? Trope. Hold on. This is what I get for having hair I don't take care of. Oh, I like this one. Um, what are the perfect writing conditions for you? That like, you know, just a day of writing, if you could make the perfect writing conditions for yourself. Like for me, I like writing in a coffee shop with, you know, some caffeine in hand, maybe a friend me working on something that they're working on and I'm jamming out in my headphones. Um, the perfect writing conditions for me would be like on a cliffside in Scotland overlooking Edinburgh, but not when it's cold. It, it would have to be like in the summer months. I'm sorry, I'm giving a very niche, very hyper-specific answer, but, but I have always imagined myself on the moors of Scotland just writing up there. I think that would be really fun. Or maybe like a library at Oxford, so. Okay, I'm gonna need my mom's help with this. I don't know what I did, but I'm just gonna leave my hair alone for now. I would probably kill myself, but uh, listen, full honesty. I, I I probably just I probably ride horses. I just I like horses. I I I, I explained this to Lee as well, but there's such a dichotomy in in writing and riding horses that I feel like people don't talk about, where they both teach you very similar life skills. Um, because writing because writing teaches you to transfer ideas into language and that's actually a feat of translation that you do not know you're consciously doing and in the same way when you're riding a horse this is a creature that does not speak and yet you have to learn to communicate with it the idea of, of what you're trying to accomplish you need to develop a language and a, a system of communication with this animal who you are not you are not looking at each other you know it's all tactile and through sound and it teaches you to be very patient with yourself. It also teaches you to be patient with external forces, you know, the horse, the ideas that you're working with. And both of those things are, are very interrelated. And I don't I never see people talk about that, ever. I've never thought about that myself. Mm -hmm. That is really cool. Um, yeah. Let's where's my other one that I like that I saw? Oh um, if you could pick one author to spend the day writing with at a bookstore, who would it be? Am I allowed to bother them? You make them look up for your writing, look over your shoulder, you can just poke them until you know they get annoyed enough. I, yeah, who would you want? R.F. Kuang. R.F. Kuang, she wrote Babel and um, The Poppy War. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I just, she's, um, we don't study the same things and she's older than I am. She's a professor, she has a PhD and everything, but in, in academics, I 
have spent a long time studying philosophy and languages, and uh, I studied Latin and ancient Greek, and I've always been interested in, you know, like I just explained, like how translation works psychologically, sociologically, and, and how communication works across different fields and everything. And she is so educated on that, and she's fluent in Chinese, and she has so many different degrees and, and fields of expertise herself when it comes to these types of things. And I feel like in writing, she also obviously does a beautiful job at executing the ideas she has. And I think she could teach me so much. Obviously, I couldn't learn everything I want to learn from her in the span of a coffee shop writing sesh, but I do feel like it'd be so fun just learning from her writing and from her and vice versa. Oh, that'd be really cool. I've actually never read uh, any of her work, but... I think you'd like The Poppy War, just from knowing you. How many people help you behind the scenes with your writing process, aside from, just like, from, aside from editors? Aside from editors, um, I mean, there's my agent, his name is Jeff, he's really great. Uh, my mom helps a lot, she, she reads my chapters, uh, some of my friends, like Max and Lee, Brad. I have people, they, they look over my shoulder and, and they're beta readers and they really, they just help a lot with, with the process of, you know, should I continue with this? What should I change here? Because they're normal people, most of them, other than you and Max and, and Lee, they're, most of them aren't writers. And because of that, they can lend a reader's lens rather than a writer's lens, which is usually way more helpful. That's something I didn't really like. Thank you so much for having me on, by the way. I love your YouTube plaques, I'm jealous. Thank you, They're, I enjoy it. Yeah, <laughs> oh my hair. Sorry, I'm like gonna, I'm gonna rip, you know what? I'm gonna go and rip my hair out of my necklace. Oh, thanks everyone for watching. Thank you for being here. Yeah, we'll be live. Thank you. My hair. <laughs> Finally got it all out. Oh, there's like little pieces here. Ow. It was like getting all dry and stuff, so I started doing new stuff to it, but it takes a while for it to work, whatever. That hurt, I hope that never happens again. <laughs> this was so crooked this whole time. Ah!